So I, I don't think parents ever have to feel alone or isolated. I think what they have to do is say, well, who, who are the people in this young person's life? And what are the different contexts? Sometimes it will be people at church, sports clubs, schools. There'll be different contexts that this child is exposed to. And where is the child actually most happy then? And I try and watch out for that. Where does the child feel safest? Where do they feel they're really themselves? And then sometimes you realize, oh, perhaps it's school where there's a bullying thing, or you know, perhaps it's, it's something else that's going on. Well, hello, welcome. Welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedules and your busy lives to join me on this panel. I really appreciate it. There was a recent UNICEF report uh, which came out during the pandemic, and it says this, that nationwide lockdowns and pandemic-related movement restrictions caused children to have spent indelible years of their lives away from family, friends, classrooms, and play. All of these are key elements of childhood itself. Mm. So I want to ask you, uh, panel, what have you seen what have you experienced in terms of how has lockdown affected kids in your community, in your locality? And maybe, Ugo, I could just start with you as a mom and as a teacher. What have you observed? Um, so, um, I mean, the, the statistics that you've uh, quoted from UNICEF is similar to what NHS have um, found. So before lockdown, um, it was estimated that one in nine children um, were experiencing mental health problems. Uh, but since the lockdown, it's uh, one in six. So that means that, you know, in a classroom, so as a teacher, you know, you um, would have, you could have up to five children in your classroom suffering with mental health um, problems. So definitely there's been an increase. Um, I mean, some of that we can attribute um, directly to the lockdown because um, as you uh, have quoted from UNICEF, you know, that's removed the structure um, that uh, children would used to, you know, being in the classroom, um, having set routines and so on. So um, that could, uh, that change in routine um, can uh, negatively impact um, children's mental health. Um, I mean, coupled with that, and obviously because it was a pandemic, you know, the, um, the news and hearing, you know, the statistics, you know, and on the news, and it's something that everybody was going through, um, children would uh, certainly have picked up on that. And um, that could um, explain why we have this increase in um, you know, mental health uh, problems, uh, particularly anxiety. Um, so uh, at college, and it's slightly older group, but certainly what we're seeing is um, more children um, reporting symptoms of um, anxiety and um, anxiety-related um, illnesses. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. And Clive, what particular uh, expressions of the effects of the lockdown are you seeing in well, young people? Well, I've seen a increase in numbers exactly like you were saying mm. my caseload has doubled since mm. since the start of lockdown and as a result of that we're seeing young people just not being able to express how they're feeling not being given the space being stuck in a in some some young people and children being stuck in a place they really didn't want to be in their households so it's about being able to unpack that being able to give them the space to have those conversations mm. great well, I want to ask you, Peter, just as a father of six, a grandfather, mm. but also with your understanding of um, biblical wisdom and understanding about our spirituality, mm. why do you think children are so vulnerable to uh, having their mental health affected in this way? Well, I think Clive hit the nail on the head when he said they don't have language. They feel, they experience, but they often lack the maturity to find the right words to express what they're going through. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you look at Scripture, it's interesting how Jesus talked about children. You know, if you look at um, Matthew chapter 18, he's talking about greatness. He gets a child. He puts the child in the middle. He says, look, you've got to become a child to be in the kingdom. But then he goes on to say, if you put a stumbling block in front of this child, it's better if a millstone were tied around your neck and you're thrown into the sea. Mm -hmm. That's some of the strongest words Jesus yes. ever uses. And there's another time, uh, it's in the next chapter, Matthew 19, where people are trying to bring young children, infants to Jesus to be blessed. And the disciples are saying, no, 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 he's way too busy for that. And Jesus says, whoa, whoa, whoa hang on a minute, let them come. And uh, let the children come to me, don't forbid them for as such as the kingdom of God. 
And so I think there's a combination here that, that children are more vulnerable because they experience life, they experience stress, but they often lack language. And that's where you get a typical tantrum or something like that. It's a lack of language, a lack of ability to actually say what's going on. And I think that puts a responsibility on parents, on carers, on teachers, on professionals to help give that language and to be understanding and patient with a child. And once you have language, you actually have power. Uh, there's something very powerful about being able to name something and identify it. And this is what you're dealing with. Um, and I think Jesus was masterful at that. And, and just coming to Jesus, letting him lay hands, letting him bless children, there's this sense of sometimes we, it's a process giving people language, but what you can do is give people peace. And I think, you know, these guys would know that far better than I do, but just talking and feeling a sense of relief, somebody understands what I'm going through. Uh, I, think, I think that's really crucial. Yes. So really the key thing that I'm hearing is really helping children to express themselves, to know how to release what they're feeling. Mm -hmm. uh, but, I, but can I ask you, because we have um, parents watching, we have teachers watching, we have church leaders, youth workers, children's workers, how, how can they practically do this? How can, because we can't reverse the effects of lockdown. It's, it is what it is, it's happened and it's even still now happening in many parts of the world. Mm. But what can all of this, this group of people mm. from parents onwards do to give that language? What are the practical steps? Mm. Could you help us with mm. that at all? I think in um, education, um, I think some of the um, steps that we've put in place is, you know, um, normalizing. So I think as um, Peter said, just um, being able to talk about mental health. Um, so I think that's a good thing, you know, um, also teaching children that, you know, mental health um, is a little bit like your physical health. You know, sometimes it's going to be good and there are going to be times that um, it might not be so good. Um, so uh, helping children to know that, you know, it's okay to have these negative feelings. It's okay to have um, moments where you might feel anxious or you might be worried about something. Um, but also uh, creating an environment, uh, particularly at school, because, you know, term time, children will spend a lot of their time um, within school, but creating environments where children feel um, uh, enabled to talk about how they're feeling, um, where we sort of normalize, you know, talking about uh, mental health. Um, Could you give an example there? Um, okay. So, I mean, an example I'll use with my children, for example, I say things like, you know, feel your feelings, you know, it's okay mm -hmm. to, if you're not feeling well, if you're not feeling uh, happy, shall we say, uh, or if you're feeling worried, it's okay to talk about it. Um, I mean, I'm really, um, really fortunate in that I can drive my daughter to school because it's on the way to work. And so um, it's a very practical way, you know, just having that space, you know, 30 minutes drive um, where we can talk. And sometimes we talk, sometimes she just wants to listen to her music. Sometimes she, you know, just wants to be quiet. But um, I think as parents, if we can um, create these environments where children can uh, talk to us, I think that's um, helpful. Um, yeah. Sorry, just a little bit mm. more, Ugum. I'm just yeah, sticking with right. you for the moment. But could that be a difficult mm. ask for a parent mm. where they've got such busy lives and running to and fro? Absolutely. And, you know, the world is rushing by. Yeah. Is that yeah. a tall order? Or it, it, how have you found yeah. time to put that into your yeah. daily life yeah. as a working mum yourself? I think maybe because I work in schools and I've seen, I can see the, the negative side and, you know, what could happen when we don't um, focus on our uh, children's mental health and, and helping our children navigate, you know, what could be, um, you know, a particularly uh, tricky subject, you know, particularly when they don't have the language, you know, to be able to express mm -hmm. how they're feeling. Um, so I think, yeah, being able to make time, I think sometimes also modeling um, behavior. So allowing our children to see, you know, when we're feeling anxious, but also how we cope with, you know, these um, situations that make us feel anxious. So um, I think modeling what um, behavior yes. can be really helpful mm -hmm. for children. Thank you. The, that word navigate yeah. is so yeah. important. Yeah. It's giving the child the heart, the space, work out what's best for that child. And they're going to try things what may not work, what does work. But actually, 
it's okay that it doesn't work. It's about finding out what's best for that, that child. Each child is individual. And giving them the space to express their feelings through that process, finding out what's, what strategies are in place to support that young person. When I feel like this, what do I do? Mm-hmm. And that's really key. For some people, that may be being creative, mm-hmm. having a colouring book, an adult colouring book. Mm-hmm. For some, some children, it would be breathing techniques mm-hmm. or um, grounding techniques. And some people will just need that, that place to distract them from what's going on at that moment mm-hmm. because it's just too much. Yes. So, uh, so as a medic, I would say that we we are taught how to recognize signs of stress in children, and you're probably familiar with many of these. But things like a child who's very irritable, difficult to console, their sleep starts getting affected, they get stomach pains, they don't like to separate from their mom and dad, or they're very clingy. In other words, very clingy, or they're throwing tantrums, hitting, biting. Uh, coming across as very aggressive or just doing a disappearing act where they just run off and they don't want to engage. When you're faced with that, those environments, those situations, what can a parent or a teacher do? Any tips? Well, that's very challenging. Um, for me, one of the things I try to do is, is I try to suggest different emotions. They might be, are you feeling sad? Are you feeling scared? Are you feeling this? And I, I, I might try and suggest some labels. Um, and usually what will happen is you, you, you can intuitively sense it as a parent, but if you don't, just going through some different emotions um, and helping them say, okay, this is, this is what you're going through and say, well, that's okay, but, but let me help you navigate that now. Can, can we talk? And sometimes it is about talking. Sometimes it's about comforting. Depends on their age. Mm-hmm. Um, I think one of the things that I found interesting about what you said, Clive, is, is that you've, you've done this with, with football teams mm-hmm. and that you've taken it out of the classroom and you've put it in a, in a, in a situation that I wouldn't normally think of. And, and I think that's a helpful thing for parents, that they collaborate with people like Clive other professionals who are working in different arenas and just say, look, I've noticed this about my son or about my daughter. We've got this kind of behavior. We're still uncertain about what we're dealing with, but maybe in this context, you can give us a clue. So I I don't think parents ever have to feel alone or Mm -hmm. isolated. I think what they have to do is say, well, who, who are the people in this young person's life? And what are the different contexts? Sometimes it will be people at church, Mm -hmm. sports clubs, schools, there'll be different contexts that this child is exposed to. And where is the child actually most happy then? And I try and watch out for that. Where does the child feel safest? Where do they feel they're really themselves? And then sometimes you realize, oh, perhaps it's school where there's a bullying thing, or, Mm. you know, perhaps it's it's something else that's going on. Very good. Yes, actually, I just want to uh, come back to you, Clive. Do you have uh, any good stories of just children who... Uh, you saw a big change in them as a result of your football coaching and helping them through mm. stress and anxiety. Uh, I think the main thing is finding, like I said, finding what, what best works for that child. Mm. Now, some children will really struggle to express themselves and actually they may not have the words to describe what that looks like. In, in school, when I'm working with children in school and young people in school, sometimes they may come to me and be, be very quiet on the first session and that's okay. And, and, and slowly see the, the child blossom. And I was working with a y- young person, linking this back to sport, linking this back to football, who on the first session just told me who he liked, what football team he liked. I got nothing else out of that child. <laughs> As we move through the weeks, and, and, it, and it will take time. It's, it's not a straightforward six-week pr- program. We work with the children as long as they need, need us. And... We saw them, uh, sort of grew conversations, grew the rapport. And as that grew, we realized actually he had a real passion for uh, football, had a passion to take that further in his career, career as he moved on. And I introduced him to the local football club. And he uh, tried, uh, eventually tried out as he went through into year, year 12, 11 into, and trialed out. And he, he got in. And actually that was the making of him because actually he was able to have routine in his life. He was able to be passionate about something. He was able to express how he feels in that. 
Wonderful. It's That's a great story. Mm. Mm. Um, Peter, I want to ask you, uh, we have uh, leaders of churches watching. Mm. Is there anything that our kids workers at, at church can do or should they be doing anything differently in this season? Yeah. Um, that's going to help children as well to feel safe, to feel uh, at, re at rest. I, I think one of the, the main things about any children's program in a church especially is um, you're, you're not caretakers while people do the real business mm -hmm. in the main sanctuary. You're, you're actually shaping their lives and you actually have a great opportunity to teach them simple truths and simple ways of dealing with life. And one of the things that we did in our own family very early on as, as the children were growing up, and you, you, you deal with things like jealousy or insecurity and things like that. And so we worked on a process where they would literally speak forgiveness to one another and say, I'm sorry, you know, ask for, ask for forgiveness, give forgiveness. We took them through a process and said, look, it's okay to be jealous. It's not okay to live with jealousy. It's okay to be afraid but it's not okay to live with fear. And, and so you, you sort of affirm the legitimacy of the emotion. Because if you don't affirm its legitimacy, what happens is children will push it down and pretend it isn't there. And then that gets buried. And that's, you've made the problem twice as bad when you do that. So you have to legitimize it. But then on the other hand, you have to say, well, there is a process. And, and let's do this. And I, I know with our own kids, they would be mad at each other one minute and I would make them face each other and say, now you need to say, I'm sorry. And then you need to say, I forgive you. And by the end of it, they were laughing because they were kind of, this is awkward, daddy. Do we really have to do this? And I'd say, yeah, it's a good process. It's, it's a good practice for you. And, and, and it ends up in a humorous way. But I think helping children in, in that kind of way and, and for workers to see, this is a great opportunity. There's great programs that have been written for kids. And, and I think, um, you know, just like a teacher takes a very professional attitude working with kids and, and Clive does, you know, as a professional who comes in in a different way, supporting them in that process, churches need to look at it. This is a very important program. And because my wife uh, was running our kids program, she took it really seriously. And in our church, we built a kids program with 300 children. And, and, and so, you know, if you, if you come at it saying, this is a brilliant opportunity, and I'm going to use it. And then there's collaboration with the parents. Hey, your child was a little sad today or a little withdrawn. And you talk to parents, are you aware of anything going on? Mm -hmm. Again, this collaborative way of yeah, speaking yes. with each other. Mm -hmm. I, I think it all strengthens oh, the family unit. I love that. And mm -hmm. helps kids. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Ugo, you also mm -hmm. have had a time working with a children's church mm -hmm. yes. in different yeah. uh, places. Anything that you want to add? Um, what Peter said. Yes, I think, you know, this idea of collaboration and, you know, having a, a holistic uh, view, I think, is really important. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, we've talked about, you know, giving children language, but I think also giving them opportunity and spaces to um, be able to um, share with each other, uh, be able to share with our youth workers, our, you know, children, Sunday school teachers, for example. Um, I think also there might be a place for um, training um, you know, with so church uh, leaders perhaps looking at training our youth and uh, children's ministry workers, um, because you know this, as we've said already, you know it's an area that's um, increasing in uh, in terms mm -hmm. of mental health problems, um, and so being able to train our um, youth workers to be able to recognise the signs, being able to um, support our children, I think would be would be important as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think you've hit on a very good point mm -hmm. there. So just as we train our young people's workers, youth workers in CPR and first aid. Yeah. They actually need mental first aid yeah, uh, training and mm. uh, awareness yeah. of how to recognize yes. stress anxiety in our children. Mm. In these final few moments, I wonder if you could just share with our audience just some practical coping strategies of uh, just uh, things that children could do such as breathing, you've already mentioned coloring, mentioned mm. being listened to, mm. but anything that we haven't heard today on this panel, any sort of wonderful things at work from your experience to help children mm. to cope, to unwind, to de-stress. Uh, can we start with you? I know you already do football, but any other gems? It's about finding that hobby. So it may be music, it may be um, 
being able to have a space to listen to music in their own in their own area in their own bedroom making sure that's appropriate with the mood as well so the playlist is really important um, or it could be so sorry to interrupt but who could um, arrange that playlist so who? that could be worked with the child and the parent so it's a it's a joint process right so you're aware right. of what 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 your child is listening to but also when i'm feeling like this when i'm feeling sad i play this playlist when i'm feeling happy and it's really important we also take the positives and the negatives we always focus on negatives as a generation we focus on negatives it's really important when something does really well that we praise that as well yeah. so playlist around really happy things happy music around that and work with the child and the parent to work that out thank you before i move on to mm-hmm. you I'm going to ask you so are you saying it's all right for a child to be sad and express their sadness and to listen to sad music for a period of time it's okay for them to allow their feelings to flow um allow their feelings to come out that's so the they key. can move mm-hmm. into a better place Great. and that's what it's about managing that place let's not stay in one place let's move to a better place super thank you you got you um I think from a, a you know parents perspective um something I do with my children something called a 20 second hug which um they love <laughs> so it's um and I think it's it's to do with the release of um neurotransmitters so and you know you feel good at the end of it but I think it's also I'm trying to to um sometimes as we've said you know they're not able to express but in that time you know just those 20 seconds um after the hug sometimes the words can then flow and they they can talk about how they're feeling um i think in terms of um school and education i think having a whole school approach i think is really important for mental health so um you know working with organizations um external organizations you know making sure that even our governors um everybody involved in the school um has you know mental health at the top of their agenda i think would then help the child you know at yes. the center so, oh, yeah it's great you're saying yeah. about hugs because mm. that does release wonderful chemicals yes. in the brain that yeah. calms a child down another tip that i learned over the years is to help a child to do deep breathing mm-hmm. but the but because they can't always count a great way to do it is they use them to trace the fingers yeah. and as the as the, what, the this finger of this hand goes up they breathe in yeah. and then they breathe out yeah. slowly and they breathe in and they breathe out and they go all the way through the yeah. the five fingers but that helps them to focus on the finger rather than on the breathing right. but that, that has a powerful de-stressing yeah. effect in the last minute <laughs> peter any final thoughts well you know one of the things that i found um with our own family and now with with our grandchildren is we, we try to end the day where we we are actually with the kids and so we have a thing that we call screen time where they're watching tv or they're on an ipad or they're doing something and and then we say look this is how much screen time you have and then we just give them a 5 minute warning 5 minutes and screen time's over and then it's like well would you like me to read your story would you like to do something together and we try and intentionally with our family we always try to intentionally connect and now we do it with our grandsons and they bring three books to me and they oh. want a story three three <laughs> stories before bedtime and then i just say would you like to pray is there anything you'd like to pray about would you like would you like granddad to pray would you like to pray just no pressure I can do it for you you can do it we can do it together. I love that Peter thank you. On that note I, we need to end uh, but thank you panel thank you for your wisdom your expertise and just really inspiring our audience today. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. Well there you are have it. Sadly that's all the time we have for today but your fit for purpose takeaway points today are Firstly, it's important that we help our children to know how to express what they're feeling using creative exercises. They can help just like coloring, listening to music. Secondly, normalize being able to talk about their mental health. Thirdly, we need to equip our children with the correct language so they can communicate with you. Fourthly, when children uh, when speaking with children, try to suggest feelings and emotions that you feel they may be going through that would be super helpful and let's give children mental health training the same way we give 
first aid, aid training. Uh, give our workers that training, but also our children and teach them things like deep breathing, hugs, music, all of those sort of things.